Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to Big Valley Grace Community Church. We're so excited that you're here. And again, if this is your first time with us this weekend, welcome. We hope that today's an encouragement to you, that you can see who we are as a church and what we're about. We want to lift up the name of Jesus. We want to come together and worship him. We want to be used by him. We're on mission together to love God, love people, and make disciples. We want to uh, we want to worship God with everything we have, give him our total worship. We want to be a, a good neighbor to those around us and have neighborly service, sacrifice, and service towards others. We desire to be connected with one another in fellowship and relationships with others who are following Jesus. We want to continue to grow together, that we'd be made in the image and the likeness of Christ. And, and we want to reach endlessly, believing that every person on this planet, that the gospel message is for them. And that means it's for you and it's for me. And we're glad to come together. We're a church that has multiple campuses. This is our Modesto campus. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online with our online campus. And we have a series campus that meets in the series community center. But we're one church and we want to honor Jesus Christ. And this weekend, uh, I'm going to do the first part of the message. And then my co-senior pastor, Rick, is going to be doing the second part of the message. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 27, verses 59 through 60. It's the last verse I'm going to share. If you don't have a Bible, just look to the screens. All the verses will be right on the screens. But we are in a world that is full of tension. And this last year has had a lot of tension. There's been a lot of tension in our personal lives. There's been a lot of tension in our country and in our world as a whole. And I think about the different tensions that exist. There's, there's physical tensions uh, between you know, health and disease. There's tensions that are spiritual between good and between evil, between holiness and between sin. There's tensions in uh, our emotions between having peace and having anxiety. There's all kinds of tensions. And for us to understand Easter and Easter weekend, we need to see that it sits in a week that was full of tension. And that week is called a holy week. It goes from Palm Sunday to Easter Resurrection Sunday. And I want to invite you in to experience and understand the tensions that exist in Holy Week through what are two incredible extremes, two things that are opposites of each other that are creating the tension. And that first extreme is life. And we see the extreme of life in the person of King Jesus best, because it's in King Jesus that victory is brought. And we see life in King Jesus as he brings victory. And in Holy Week, we see that beginning most publicly at Palm Sunday. And here's what the scripture says. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, the entire crowd understands him to be the conquering king that is coming into town. He is the one who has brought victory. He is the one who has brought life. How did this Jesus become so famous? Well, at the beginning of his ministry, the Bible says he was doing this. They brought him all the sick those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him. People who were blind were now seeing and experiencing new life. People who were deaf were now hearing and experiencing new life. People who were paralyzed were now walking and experiencing new life. People who had great fevers were well. And they were experiencing new life. People who were demon-possessed were free from the bondage and slavery of oppression. And they experienced new life. And crowds began to follow Jesus everywhere he went. There was a young man. He was just a teenager as he began following Jesus. And later in life, he looks back and he describes Jesus just in this phrase. In him was life. That is who Jesus is. He is life. He is the extreme of life. And as King Jesus comes into contact, he's bringing victory with everyone he meets. And they're experiencing true life. A physician 
whose job was to really take a careful account of the life and ministry of Jesus, and he, he interviewed many people, he records that Jesus makes this statement, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Life is more than our stuff. Life is more than what we have or what we don't have. And as Jesus was ministering, these crowds were so eager to hear the things that he was saying. And to one of those eager crowds, Jesus makes this statement. He says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. In other words, there is real life. There is true life. And the gate is very narrow that enters into it. And the way is very hard that leads to it. And only a few find it. But real life exists. As Jesus began saying things like this, he drew lots of questions. He drew lots of attention. In fact, one lawyer came to him really to test him and to find out how it was possible that these things he was saying was true. And he just simply asked this question, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? If the gate is narrow and the way is hard and only a few find it, what must I do? How can I possibly have eternal life? This is a common question. Jesus was asked this question many times by many people. There was a rich young ruler. He was very wealthy. He oversaw much. And he came to Jesus with the same question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was asked this question so many times, and he answered it many times. On one occasion, he answered this question to a secret inquirer. This man was very religious. He was very public. He was a public figure, but he didn't want to publicly be seen with Jesus. So he came to Jesus at night under the cloak of darkness for a secret meeting, and he asked these same types of questions. And listen to how Jesus answers it. That whoever believes in him, in Jesus, may have eternal life. That's the key. That's the key that unlocks the gate to eternal life. It is believing in him. It's believing in Jesus. And what happens when a person believes in Jesus? Well, Jesus had a conversation with a social outcast. This woman had a lot of hard, broken history of relationships. She was not publicly admired in her town, and she was out at a well in the middle of the day by herself. And Jesus spoke to this woman looking at the well and looking at this woman, a social outcast, and he makes this statement about water. The water that I give will be a spring of water. It'll be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, when you believe in Jesus, there is a water of Jesus that begins to flow in and out of your life, welling up to eternal life as you place your faith in Jesus. Jesus performed many miracles. On one occasion, he took just a few loaves of bread and a few fish, and he fed 5,000 people. And as those people ate the fish and they ate the bread, they came looking for more miracles. They came following after because they ate the fish and they ate the bread and they wanted to do it again. And so they followed Jesus seeking more miracles and Jesus knew this. They were looking for physical bread. And listen to what he says to them. He says, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me shall not hunger. In other words, eat the bread of Jesus and you're gonna be satisfied you're not going to hunger anymore. Jesus had all kinds of situations in life, just like you've had. One of his very closest friends died. And as he's having a conversation with the sister of that close friend, and she is grieving, Jesus says this to that grieving sister. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, even though you die, it is possible for you to live again. And that possibility is in me because I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And as people heard the message of Jesus, not everyone received it openly. Some had questions, some had confusion. And there was one disciple that was doubting in particular with a lot of questions and a lot of confusions. And Jesus says this to the doubting disciple. He said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. As Jesus would make statements like this, 
it would cause great opposing, opposing sides in the crowds that he would speak to. In fact, they would turn into divided mobs at some points. And listen to what he says to the divided mob in this statement here. Look at this second sentence. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's extreme number one, is life. Jesus is the king who brings victory, and he is life. And he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But this first sentence is also true. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that's extreme number two, and it's death. And it's where the story turns here as we see that King Jesus suffers this horrible apparent defeat. And it begins with a lethal plot. It says, then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. A murderous hit squad has been formed. They betray him. They arrest him. They torture him. They bring him before the governor. And the governor asks this, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. The same, the same crowd that said, behold, behold is the king. Blessed is the king. They're now yelling, let him be crucified. So they take him and they torture him and they beat him and they nail him to a cross. And while he's on the cross, they begin to mock him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. Look how he brought life the extreme of life to so many people, and yet here he is at the extreme of death. He can't even save himself. And then we see in the scriptures this royal death. As Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The king dies a royal death, and the earth erupts in response. My 13-year-old daughter asked me this week, Dad, how could it possibly be called Good Friday when it's the day that they killed Jesus? A bold follower looked back on this moment and he spoke to religious leaders and he said it this way, you killed the author of life. Jesus is the extreme of life and you took it to the extreme of death and you killed him. The followers of Jesus began to grieve and they began to mourn. And we find out about one generous mourner. His name is Joseph of Arimathea. And he, Joseph takes the body of Jesus and he wraps it in a clean linen shroud and he lays it in his own new tomb, which he'd cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and he went away. At the death of one that you love, the grief is enormous. The grief often feels unbearable. And it takes one another to share in that grief together. I'm so thankful for the ministry called Grief Share at Big Valley Grace Community Church where men and women come together to share the burden of grief and loss and to mourn in a way that is safe and directs them to Jesus Christ. And here we see the followers of Jesus grieved and mourning the pain almost unbearable. And here we see Holy Week, Holy Week, and the tense extremes of a life-giving, triumphal victory and the apparent suffering defeat of King Jesus, who is now dead in a tomb. So let me just reiterate something. Jesus is dead. He died on a Friday. He's dead. Died on a cross. The Romans were experts at killing people. Experts at it. I saw a couple of 
clips this week of some liberal theologians, some liberal pastors who um, both of them said that, you know, Jesus, when he was taken off the cross, really wasn't dead. He, he had shallow breathing. They thought he was dead, but he really wasn't dead. And it's like, dude, these guys are like losers. Hey, hey, he was dead. He died. He died on a Friday. He was buried in a tomb or a cave on Friday. The one who came and brought life, as Pastor Joel was just sharing, is now, is now dead. And by the way, Jesus wasn't the only one who died on Friday. We know of two others that hung next to Jesus. They died on Friday. There probably were a whole bunch of others who died on Friday. There were people who died on Friday who, I don't know, they didn't die on a cross. Maybe they died of cancer. There were people on Friday who may have died because, uh, I don't know, uh, an ox gored him. There were people who died on Friday. I don't know, maybe they fell off of their roof and, you know, hit their heads. A lot of people died on Friday, not just Jesus. And just so you know, there were a whole lot of people who died on, on Thursday. People who died on crosses on Thursday. People who died of cancer on Thursday. People who, who, who died of a concussion on Thursday. There were people who, who died on Wednesday. All kinds of people died on, on Wednesday. In fact, Jesus died on Friday. You know, a whole bunch of people died on Saturday. A whole bunch of people were, were, were executed on Saturday. There were a whole lot of people who died on Saturday. A whole lot of people died on Sunday. In fact, for 2,000 years, you, you know what's happened every day? People have died. They may not have died on crosses. We still, um, you know, uh, have our form of capital punishment even here in the United States. It might be lethal injection or whatever. But people die of cancer and, 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 and all kinds of things today. You see, one of the things we all have to face is death. Ecclesiastes 1 says, generations come and generations go. In other words, you know, people are born and then they live and they get married and then they have children and those children grow up and have children and then grandma and grandpa die and then those children and they die. Generations come and generations go. In other, in other words, people die. Ecclesiastes goes on and says in chapter three, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. There's a time to be born, right? You, you, there, there was a time, I don't know when it was. We usually celebrate those days, right? Your birthdays, that's when you were born. But there's coming a day when you will die. And that's celebrated too in, in a lot of ways home-going celebrations, whatever they might be. Ecclesiastes 8 says, no man, no woman has the power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the day of his death. Just a reality of life. 2,000 years ago, a guy named Jesus died on a cross and was put into a tomb. And every day before that and every day after that, people have died. Death is the one appointment we'll all keep. For Jesus, that appointment was on Friday and it was an appointment. He was born into this world for a reason, for that appointment. 
Everything about his life led up to that moment on Friday when he took his last breath on that cross. For the two guys that were hanging next to Jesus, their appointment was Friday. You will not escape your appointment. Can't do it. There's no biblical truth more obvious to people than the inevitability of death. Every town in the world has at least one cemetery. The planet is literally covered with cemeteries. Literally covered with them. Pastor Rick Thompson and Pastor Lonnie Skiles and I, Pastor Joel, who's probably in the back room, Pastor Scott uh, Elliott back there, we, we've been to lots of cemeteries. Lots of them. Someone once said, death is the undisputed victor in life because it always wins. Solomon makes an interesting statement. And we'll begin to maybe shift gears here just a tad. He said, death is the destiny of every man, every person. So the living should take this to heart. I mean, since death is in your future, it's in mine, there's an appointment you're gonna keep. You don't don't necessarily know when it is. Shouldn't you give it some thought? Doesn't it make some sense to go, okay, I know death is coming, It's a part of my future. And so, so maybe I ought to give it a, a, just a thought or two. I don't know, for like three minutes. Just think about it for three minutes. Two. Man, you know, death is coming. And I'm not talking about, you know, did I, you know, get the tombstones all picked out for me and my spouse? And did I pay for, you know, the burial plots? I'm not talking about that. That's not what Solomon's talking about here. He's saying, hey, because death is coming, give it a thought. I've I've done the the funerals of people that made it to 100. I've done the funerals of people that made it to 80. I've done the funeral of those who made it to 50. 50. I've done the funeral of some who made it to 30. I've done way too many funerals of those who died in their teens. I've even done the funeral of some who only lived for a few seconds. For some reason, the sovereign hand of God moved and the baby was born and it didn't live. And I think what Solomon says here is pretty good advice. And that is, hey, look, since death is coming, I mean, have you thought it through? Have you thought in your brain, you know, what what happens? And it's kind of final. That's why there's so much pain behind it. I'm never going to see grandpa again. I'm never going to see grandma again. I'm never going to see my mom or my dad or my sister or my friend. The reason why it's so painful is because, wow, it's final. There's no do-overs at that moment. Now, because of this, because death is guaranteed, Job asked this question. And it might be the most important question, you know, ever asked by anybody. He said this. If a man dies, will he live again? In other words, what happens when you die? I guess him and Solomon are kind of saying the same thing. 
Obviously, there's this moment when Job goes, man, okay, man, he's seen a lot of people die. They buried a lot of people, put rocks on top of people. You know, is, is this it? What happens when you die? Job's asking the million dollar question. It's been on the hearts of people since the beginning of time. And I know for some of you, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, I think it's probably on your heart right now. At least I hope it is, that was my point. So back to the question, what happens when you die? What, what, what happens when you finally take your last breath? What happens? Beloved, the, the Bible teaches that whenever a follower of Jesus Christ dies, at the very moment they take their last breath here on planet Earth, their next breath, bam, is way different. Their next breath, if you will, is in the very presence of the Lord. In a place that's not like planet Earth. Planet Earth has been all goofed up because of sin. Pollution and, 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 and just, you know, water's all goofed up and as beautiful as these plants are, they're goofed up from sin. Everything's been goofed up from sin. Imagine, you die here and boom, your next breath. You're in a place where there's no sin. There's no doctors, there's no hospitals, there's no uh, hospice, there's no pharmacies, there's no band-aids, there's no psychotropic drugs, there's no Tylenol, there's no ibuprofen, and I take a bunch of that for no reason. I just hurt. No more hearing aids, no more glasses. All these are just the outcome of sin. These bodies of ours just decay. I want to walk you through this, and I want you to pay really close attention, okay? Some of these things Pastor Joel talked about. I'll dig into them a little bit more. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. He said, I have come. You ever want to know why Jesus came? What's the big deal? Why, why do we celebrate Christmas? What's, what's the point? What's the point of that little baby being born in that little town called Bethlehem? What's that all about? Jesus now is no longer a baby. He's at least 30 years old and he says, let me tell you why I came. Let me tell you why you got a Christmas tree up at your house. Let me tell you why you put a wreath on your door. Let me tell you why you put lights up on your house. Let me tell you why you buy each other presents and send out all your Hallmark cards. Let me tell you why you do all that baking. Let me tell you why I came. I came that you might have life. That's why I came. And that life there doesn't mean that you'd have a great life down here. That's not what he's talking about. This isn't a Tony Robbins, you know, speech on how you can have a great life down here. Just walk across the coals, you know. It's stupid. See, Jesus knew you were gonna take your last breath. He knew death was an appointment you'd all keep. And he says, let me tell you why I came. I came that you might have life eternal. Not life down here forever. You can't do that. I, I man, dude, I, I used to be young, used to, 
be able to eat anything, yeah, pancakes and just stuff. I, 12 o'clock at night, just eat. Just, my body was like, like, like this. Now I look in the mirror and go, what happened? I became the very man that I used to mock. And those of you that are young out here, guess what? It's coming. <laughs> You're going to go, I remember that guy preaching one day. I'm now the guy he used to talk about. You can just see the impact of sin. Just make sure, just just change. Jesus knew it was coming and he said, let me tell you why I came. I came that you might have life eternal. Life eternal. As Jesus was preparing for his own crucifixion, his own death, he wanted to make sure that his followers would know exactly what was going to happen to him after he died. And so he said this in John chapter 14. He's trying to give them an image of something that they can grasp a hold of. And he says, don't let your heart be troubled, guys. Trust in the Lord. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He's helping these guys see something. Guys, I came to give you eternal life. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna go away, but when I go away, why don't you kind of think about it this way. Imagine, you know, you're getting a new house built. I'm gonna be the construction manager on the house. He's not the construction manager. He's trying to help us capture something that's real, that heaven is a real place, that glory is a real place. And he said, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. That's why I came. That was the whole purpose of me leaving the glories of heaven and being born in that little town called Bethlehem. That was the whole purpose for the 30 years that I spent on this planet living a perfect life for you. It was the purpose of the cross. It's the purpose of it all. And someday, guys, it's not gonna be today where I'm going. You're going to be there with me. Wow. Jesus went on to say this in John chapter 14. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody's ever going to get to heaven. Nobody's ever going to get to glory. Nobody's ever going to get to the Father unless they come through me. Jesus said, I'm it. That's why I came, I came to bring life. I'm going there to prepare a place for, for you. Let me tell you, the only way you get there, the only way is through me. Jesus was, was very narrow-minded. Said, I'm it. You wanna, you wanna get to glory, you wanna live eternally, it only happens one way. And that's through me. That's through our relationship with me. The great apostle John weighed in with these words. He said, and this is the testimony. That this is, you know, you can almost boil down the whole book. All these pages, which are a lot. You can almost boil it down to these couple of verses right here. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It's just that simple. God created you when you were inside your mother's womb. He knows you better than anybody. Salvation is a simple thing. It's not complex. Like, like, like two-year-olds can figure it out. God says, look, the reason I came was to give you life. That's why I came. And this life is in my son. If you have my son, 
You have the life. If you don't have my son, then you just don't have the life. That's why there's this weird psalm, Psalm 116, and it says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now that just sounds weird. Precious? I mean, we hate it when someone dies. Why, why, how, really? Yeah, you know why? Because when one of his people, one of his children, one of his saints dies, they go be with him. So for him, it is precious. I shared this with you before, but it's a great story and it just fits. You know, there's his dad's driving down the road. He's got his son all strapped in the back seat of his car, you know, in his little chair, it's all hooked in. And as they were driving down the road, windows were down, all of a sudden the kid starts screaming, dad, 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 daddy, daddy, daddy. And you know, dad's looking back, he looks in the rear view mirror and there's a bee flying around. And the kid's going crazy and dad's, you know, doing 40 miles an hour down the street and trying to get over. And the kid's just screaming and the dad's back there trying to hit the bee, you know. And finally he, he grabs the, he grabs the bee, dad's got the bee. And he pulls the car over. And he says, son, everything's okay. Everything's okay. And dad opens his hand and the bee flew out. Dad, dad, why'd you do that? Why'd you let that dad go? Dad, dad, are you crazy? And the dad said, son, 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 I told you, everything's okay. The stinger's right here in my hand. That bee can't hurt you anymore. Jesus took the stinger out of death. It can be a scary thing. What happens? Some people, man, it's so frightening. They don't even think about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. Well, Solomon's right. Shouldn't you? Shouldn't you think about it? How? how? How did Jesus take the stinger out of death? How can Jesus offer us eternal life? What, oh, okay, I, I get it. I understand we're all going to die, Pastor, but why Jesus? Every, everything's been about this Jesus. All the songs you sang were about Jesus. You keep telling us it's Jesus. Jesus himself kept, kept telling us it's Jesus. How can we go to heaven when we die? Why, why, why does everything got to pass through Jesus? Well, it's all because of what we're celebrating right now. That's, that's right, Easter. You see, Jesus died on Friday. The one who came and brought life to so many is now dead, and it seems like this is weird, it's horrible, but we call it Good Friday. They didn't call it Good Friday back then. We call it that because we know what happened on Sunday. On Sunday, Jesus walks out of the cave. He walks out of the tomb. He was alive. Death didn't do one thing to him. In fact, let me give you two things that the resurrection proves. Number one, the resurrection proves it. It proves that Jesus was who he said he was. And that was the son of God. All throughout Jesus' ministry on, on planet Earth, he kept telling everybody in different ways, I, I, I'm not like you. I'm the son of God. And in fact, I, I'm gonna show you I'm not like you. And he did a lot of miracles. Let me show you how I'm not like you, man. The guy can preach like no one's business, man. You see, 
All the people who died on Friday, they're still dead. The people who died on Saturday are still dead. Guess what? There's not been one person ever who's walked out of the tomb because only one person would have the power to do it, and that would be the Son of God. That was the moment where he proved. I kept telling you I was the Son of God. I kept showing you I was the Son of God. I kept saying it over and over again. But the second thing that it proves is this, the resurrection proves, is that Jesus has the power that he said he had. And guess what he kept saying? I'll give you life. I'll give you eternal life. You want eternal life? I can give it to you. You put your trust in me, I'll give you eternal life. Well, anybody can say that. Any, any dumb guy could say that. But once he walked out of the grave, he proved who he said he was, and that was the Son of God. And so that also proves, hey, I got the juice. If I tell you, you can conquer death. If I tell you, you can have eternal life. You can have it, because I got the power that I said I had. And so, we have this God who brought life, who died, who then walks out of a tomb and he offers life to anybody that would accept it. I wanna end with this, this video, it's just a couple of minutes long, and then I'm gonna come back up and kinda of wrap some things up here. But check out this video real, real, real quick. I saw Jesus crucified. I spoke to him as he died. I saw him in his struggle. I watched as he breathed his last breath and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I am nothing, and I left everything to follow him. If I knew it would have ended like this, well, I guess I may have reconsidered. I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. And he was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then, she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. The Roman seal was broken. And in those days, you did not mess with the Romans. So whoever did this was either bold or God. I looked on the floor and I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew he rose. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death. Nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. 
for you. He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive. Wow. Yeah. So this is what I want to do. I know some of you are watching online, and I just, I just know that there are people in this room, and you're going, man, I want Jesus. I want him in my life. I want to know that when my appointment comes, it's all square. We're all good because he cleansed me of my sin. I want to know him. And Pastor Bobby had you fill out a, a card, a communication card that he, he asked you to hold on to. This is what I want you to do. If you're here and you go, I've, I've never given my life to Christ, or maybe you're watching online right now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what to do. But those of you that are in this room, I just want you to take that communication card that has your name and number on it and all that, and if you just put a little square up in the corner and when you're done, you just walk out. We have these connect boxes all over. You just drop that in there. I will get those cards tonight. Actually, Joel will get a copy of them. I'll get a copy of them tonight. And we'll be praying for you. It's a big decision you're making. In fact, you don't even know how big a decision it is. You don't even know the implications of it. And we want to pray for you. It could be you want to take that card, and I'm going to be in there's a little room right over. Well, it's not a little room. It's a big room. And myself and Pastor Rick Thompson and, and Pastor Joel Boom, we're just gonna be hanging out in there for a little bit. If you wanna come in and actually give us the card and we can meet you, that'd be super cool. Maybe you don't own a Bible, we'll give you a Bible in there. We'll give you your own Bible. We'll give one for you and your whole family. Okay, if you, if you would put a square up there. It could be uh, you're here and you're going, you know what, man, it's been a long time since I've been in church and I've kinda gotten away from the Lord. I've let other things become more important in my life. And maybe today is the day you go, oh, I'd like to rededicate my life to the Lord. I wanna walk out of here going, man, you know what, God, I got off track with my relationship with you, and today I'm renewing it. You, you could put a star over in the other corner, and that way when Pastor Joel and I get these cards, we can be praying for you. We'll know, hey, you're a believer, but man, for whatever reason, you got sideways with the Lord, but now you're saying you're, you're back, and that'd be a great thing. We'll rejoice with you, and you can just put a little, a little star up there, okay? And if you want to, you can come in the altar and say hi to Joel, hi to me, and just go, here, man, I made a decision, man, thanks for this Easter gathering. There might be a group of you here, and you're going, you know what, man, I, I need to... I need to grow maybe in my faith a little bit. And we have the follow class. Pastor Bobby and Heather talked about it a little bit ago. Uh, and if you'd like to be a part of the follow class, wow. That, that, that's, you need to come to that. It's really fantastic. It's way different than this. You sit around tables. You can, it's very interactive. You get to ask questions. But we go over some of the basic things that you find in here, the basic things that every believer should really know and anybody in here can take that class. It, literally anybody. And if you're out there and you're going, you know what, I know the Lord and, and you know, I, I'm not rededicating my life, but I sure would like to you know, take that class. You know, all you gotta do is put a, put a triangle in the middle. So aren't you glad you took all those classes in school to learn what a square was and a triangle and all that? And what we'll do is we'll invite you to the class. We'll say, hey, you know, we'll remind you of the class and we'll send you an email or whatever, just reminding you of the class. Could be you go, hey, I'd like to be baptized. Well, what I want you to do there is just, I want you to write that on the card. Just say, I want to just put uh, bap, baptized. And we'll call you and we'll, we'll schedule you to come. And man, it's really, it's really fantastic. And you can bring that into the room and give it to one of us. Or you can just put it in the, in the box. Okay, whatever one you want to do, but we sure would love to meet you. The pastors, Joel and I and Rick and Lonnie and Bobby, we'll all be in there. So come in and hand us your card and say hi and we'll look at it. And We're not going to keep you very long. Just meet you, shake hands with you or whatever and give you a Bible if, if you need one. Does that, does that make sense? 
Well, I'm going to pray, and then we got uh, one last song that the band has for you. It's one of these songs that they just wanted to minister to you, okay? So, Father, thank you, Lord, for our time here. Thank you for how you're working in our lives, and I pray this in your name. Amen.